My journey has been one of returning from the darkness and stepping out into the light once more. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. While you're sitting trying to figure that out, this is my podcast. Allegedly. Logos and Trivial podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. Maybe you're also Logos and Trivial. While you're trying to figure out how to pronounce that, let me introduce today's illustrious guest. I have with me Longstone. Longstone is a man I met on Twitter. We started to sort of connect or I guess uh, resonate on certain ideas of uh, liberty or thinking about things from like uh, maybe anti-centralized power or collectivist power perspective. Um, and then from there, we kind of just have gotten to know each other a little bit on a, just a sort of internet buddy basis, but Longstone's also, um, co-creator of a really interesting and, um, powerful shooting training system. And he's just a all around interesting guy. So with that, uh, sort of spaced out and rambling introduction. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. And why don't you tell the audience a little more about who you are and what you do? Thanks, Chance. Uh, my background is in software and systems architecture. Um, so I basically spent 30 years in the industry working on different types of distributed systems, um, some very large scale ones, uh, working for everything from mom and pop shops to Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I've also done a fairly deep dive into Mrs. So in university days that uh, basically went going back to the roots of Paleolithic shamanism work before from there. Uh, from that, I got into kind of um, mainstream Freemasonry. Um, so I've been a Freemason since like 2002, uh, basically gone through every everything within the York Rite. And there's about, uh, I think there's like some 20 some odd different degrees and orders that I've gone through in Freemasonry. I also spent a fair bit of time in the uh, the master's seat. So between 2007 and last year, uh, basically didn't get out of it, didn't get out of the principal officer's seat for like 12 years. So I served, hard to count. That was about 15 terms across four different Masonic bodies or sorry, four different Masonic structures, and uh, yeah, tend to go deep dive on stuff. Um, yeah, sorry, rambling. <laughs> That's me in a nutshell. Uh, at this point in time, the last three years, I've been trying to launch a business. That's a uh, fire training simulation. Uh, it's like a golf simulator, but you're using it for training with firearms. Um, the warrior tradition has always been kind of interesting to me. Uh, I have this expression I use frequently. Uh, the only true battles are within, or sorry, from Temujin to Tenzin, the only true battles are within. So from Genghis Khan to the Dalai Lama, what, how did that journey take place? And I think it was through the uh, application of applied discipline. So uh, you apply the warrior tradition long enough and it starts to drift off into the abstract and the esoteric and uh, the spiritual tradition. So I think mastery and discipline are kind of the way forward out of everything. Hmm. So do you think then that it is necessarily the case that the uh, path to mastery starts in the external and then migrates to the internal? Is that what you're saying? That's sort of like a a mandatory process? In terms of development, yes, it's a mandatory process. How people go about it, like not everybody has a whole lot of internal motivation. I mean, I really didn't as a kid. It was something that I learned. Um, engage with the things that you're passionate about. Learn how to develop work process, working processes in there. Learn how to apply yourself. Learn how to do you know, your basic organizational skills and things like that. And once you kind of built up those skills and something that you're passionate about, those are transferable skills into other domains. 
Hmm. So, I mean, I was extremely not orderly as a kid. Uh, and then by the time I was in my 20s, I basically turned into a workaholic. <laughs> so it's easy to uh, shift. And uh, that interplay from kind of going from one extreme to the other, I think, is something to look at as well. So I think that plays out in some of the personality temperament stuff. Like people are highly neurotic. It's either going to be going to manifest in uh, withdrawal or explosiveness and whatever someone's baseline tendencies like I was uh, it basically withdrawal is my mode in terms of stress and if you push someone too far that's going to flip into explosiveness likewise the people who are really fucking bombastic they hit that stress level they're going to shut down and go into quiet mode hmm. so um, part of the idea for me is uh, you're developing weakness as opposed to playing to strength. If someone's just like play to strength, play to strength, you know, do what you're good at, uh, you're going to end up a one trick pony. Your skill sets are going to be very narrowly adapted. And I think, especially in the context that we're at, you need to have widely adapted skills. Um, you need to be familiar with multiple different domains and how they intersect. So we can't just like kind of sit in isolation be a cog or a widget within the context of society you as much as possible for you because it's definitely different for other people but you need to kind of round yourself out whatever your default temperamental disposition is or you know wherever you fall on the big five it's not fixed so it, that's kind of the thing between nature and nurture the You've had kids, so you know, they, they come out, they've got their own personalities from the beginning. They're not a fucking blank slate, any remotely stretch of the imagination. Um, but whatever your starting point is, you need to grow from there. So wherever you're in deficit, I think those are the areas that you kind of need to work on and develop out to actually make yourself a more rounded person. Hmm. I think the more rounded and balanced we are, uh, A, we have more resilience and we're more capable of doing it effective problem solving, especially complex problem solving. And I think we're lacking a whole lot of complex problem solving capacity in society in general. Like I look at the problems that we have to deal with at structural levels and people can't even see like, you know, 5%, 10% of what's actually on the table, what's required to just start looking at these problems and taking an honest assessment of them. It's all kind of uh, emotional reaction and, do what feels good, follow your bliss, that kind of, it's all going to be okay. It's like, well, it will be if you get off your ass and try to resolve things. Um, but at the same time, you can't be totally pig-headed about that as well. Uh, you need to have situational awareness. You need to be able to assess the data and the information that's coming in around you and to be able to respond to that accordingly. Yeah, so... As I was listening to what you were saying, I was, I was sitting there, you know, weighing it. And um, one of the one of the things that I connected with quite a bit is there's a there's sort of this. I like to think of things in terms of cycles and patterns. <clears throat> and there's this sort of a, there's this interplay between, like you mentioned, uh, what happens between extremes. There's this line from a, a rapper I quite like named Aesop Rock, and he says, respect the polars, but acknowledge middle value rainbows. And it's sort of like, a, you know, there's this interplay between these extremes, and sometimes those can be much further apart. Sometimes they can be close, kind of depending on the momentum of the culture and where they're at in that moment. But as you, as you move back and forth between these things, it's sort of uh, all this interplay of ideas and people and the spectrum of what's happening between those sort of, it really does add a lot of color, but in order to uh, sort of rise to the next paradigm there, you have to, um, you have to make sure that as you're moving back and forth between these, like, it's like a, a respiration of your life experience, you know, you sort of inhale education and inhale ideas and you inhale uh, sort of the vantage that's before you. And then you, and then you exhale 
and you and you synthesize you know it's like all right this is where i'm putting my effort this is where i'm putting my focus this is where i'm using all the new knowledge that i have to try to move forward in a direction that i met obstacles on the last round but if you can't there's stuff in the middle there that's messy and if you aren't able to sort of process the mistakes and take the lessons that are sort of part of that extreme swaying process then what you're left with is this uh, sort of like obstructive force of denial and dishonesty and it it kind of melts you within but it manifests without in the in the way that you treat people and the way that you look at the world and unless you deal with that it can continue to fester and i guess i'm wondering number one sort of what do you suppose is uh, sort of the cause of this sort of mass festering and number two as you're talking about this sort of educational process this life educational process and these systems or patterns i guess i'm wondering how that kind of thinking has shaped the more concrete stuff how has it shaped the way that you have programmed software or designed your shooting simulator to uh, be able to sort of like act those things out in real time how do the principles align in the other stuff that you do? I'll hit the shooting simulator first, and then I'll talk about the complexity bridge and uh, and from there um, kind of tessellation of consciousness. So the the firearms training platform that I built um, it's not new. There's been stuff like this on the market since the '80s. So militaries across the world have been using this since like mid 80s uh, usually video based technology there's you know three or four major companies in that military procurement space uh, mega training systems uh, virtua ranges milo um, these are all like you're you're looking at like hundred fifty thousand dollars to start just to set something up there's a couple of other platforms um, that are more consumer grade even though you're looking at like $15,000 to start whenever you get um, an application or a plugin from them. It's basically a standalone application. So you buy compiled game, you install compiled game, and that's the piece. That's everything you have access to. If you want something else, you have to go buy another module, add it in. So uh, with my background in like large scale web stuff, I'm I looked at the platform, so the platform is kind of a standalone thing. All the things that you do in terms of exercises in there are all brought in as data structures and kind of injected into the environment. So every course definition and where the targets are placed and where the props are placed are all actually stored in a database in terms of their location data and just plunk, they get popped into the system. So the core platform doesn't require updates that frequently, but we can generate content and uh, get it out to people like literally like can go into the database work on something put it in go refresh your screen and oh it's there and available so the content model is very different and our pricing model is like very different we're subscription based um it's like 30 bucks a month us or 30 pounds a month for europe um you get a base subscription and then you can kind of tack on modules there so the architecture of that of basically having quote unquote like a dumb client uh Thought really dumb. We're using Unreal Engine, so the environments and the props and assets, like the, the, the physical "quote unquote" pieces of that, have to be baked into the engine. But how they're displayed and arranged is completely data structure. Hmm. Uh, so I think, yeah, I won't dive any deeper into that. But um, let me let me jump in there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a. Because that's very similar. I mean, I guess when you're trying to simulate reality, you have to think about the rules of reality and try to emulate them as best you can. And one thing that really sort of hit with me right there was um, there are sort of uh, governing rules that have to be in place uh, in order for it to be a consistent reality. But then there are things that can be built on top of that that are just sort of pick and choose. Um, and I guess I... <laughs> I'm just kind of curious uh, your thoughts on the on the symmetry with a person's real life decision making apparatus in that way. Well, when I said I wasn't going to go any further, I 
what I was going to was uh, Ian McGilchrist and the left right brain mm. sort of thing. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> right on. <laughs> so the left brain is that uh, <clears throat> the default mode network. I mean, it's, so the left brain's driving the bus in the default mode network, um, speech and aggression type stuff, where it's everything else is basically split, split and it happens within the whole brain. So if the platform itself is uh, kind of the left brain, it has its mode, you know, the physics engine is baked in, we're not messing with that in real time, but uh, the right brain is kind of the back end of the data store. And you've got this balance between here's the fixed operational system. <clears throat> and um, the other part of the brain is constantly doing situational awareness and reintegrating new information into that. Hmm. So I think that's, that, that's part of the problem where we're in, socially speaking, I think, is because, hey, we're trapped in dichotomy. You need to break dichotomy in order to do anything effective. You can't solve multi-dimensional or three-dimensional or multi-dimensional problems in two-dimensional thinking. It's just like it's not fucking possible. So um, that interplay is what we're missing. So like in the early 90s, left and right in terms of the political spectrum, um, they kind of meant something. Like if you knew someone was conservative, you had a fairly clear idea of um, not just the discussed sensitivities and the moral proclivities, but it was also you had an aspect of uh, the type of thinking that they were they were doing. And the lefties were kind of out, you know, looking at everything, man. Um, <laughs> but over the last 30 years, the the left wing has started to think like the bottom of the barrel right wing, like your church fundamentalists and whatever else. They've started the default mode network. You've got these very narrow patterns of habituation, and basically everybody is thinking on a script. And if you take that script between the Christian fundamentalist or the social justice warrior fundamentalist, you can just change it to fucking variables, and they're saying the same thing at a structural level. Like the structural part of the thinking is exactly the fucking same. And that's where things really went down the tubes, I think. Hmm. Because <clears throat> the, 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 at the lowest level, those political spectrums are mapping what's happening in the brain. The right wing or left brain dominant um, should be doing all the kind of procedural stuff and making things run effectively. Whereas uh, the left wing, the right brain, should be bringing in new information that's integrating in. But when these things are both on the same pattern, which is basically the default mode network, it just leads to an ever tighter and tighter pattern of habituation. So it just becomes this narrowing focus and tunnel. As that's happening, partisanship is increasing because people are basically cut off from the prefrontal cortex. They're dropping down into the limbic system and all of their engagement is at the limbic system level. I mean, uh, that expression I use sometimes, the, the evolution will be encrypted. Everything that we've built up in terms of social circuits has been effectively shoehorned on these low-level implementations of emotional strata. Hmm. So I mean, um, we have to kind of go through this complexity chain. So that's the piece I was going to refer to before. I mean, everything, whether it's systems or cognition or whatever. You basically start point, line, area, which you need a minimum of three points. That's the tessellation thing. Point, line, area, volume, abstraction, and then gauge, which is calibrated abstraction. So some of this ties in with uh, some of the stuff I've seen from Eric Weinstein. So his thing on spinorial symmetries in the 720 degrees, like the uh, that dance thing. I think there's a uh, Himalayan wine dance, is that what it's called? Where it, it's doing a circle, it's, but it's doing basically two circles. You can either unfold that into an infinity symbol or uh, a Lorenz attractor or something like that. But though that symmetry, uh, I think, seems to be very clear. So people are sometimes stuck up here or they're stuck down here. There's no, they're not bridging those two points, which all of them are quote unquote natural being stuck in stasis at a specific spot. So the system is no longer moving. It's 
fixed or jammed in a particular position. At that point, the system's effectively broken. Hmm. So as the I, polar as thing. I, as I was thinking, I really like to visualize the things that I'm saying and also listening to. That's sometimes why when I'm speaking, I go like this and sound like a stuttering robot because I'm, I'm busy using the resources to visualize. And one of the things I like to try to do because of my tendency to do that is to relate those visualizations to human behaviors because interesting ideas often come from that. Um, and one of the things I was just thinking about is sort of how there's this, you know, you said people in the discourse, in this, in the cultural discourse, and in a lot of different areas are sort of prefrontal cortex. It's just like, nah, we're going full lizard. Uh, yeah. And I, th and I think one of the contributing factors or sort of, um, the thing that kicks it over to there is often the intensity of the exchange where if there's like a sort of small amplitude disagreement, it's more, you know, it's often more fine tuned. It's sort of like a, a rich intellectual debate over a fine point. But if no concord can be found between those little ones, they sort of hit each other. And, and then once it kicks out into uh, a wide enough distribution, there are always those people, sort of the people that are talked about in sanction where they're just people who get a hold of an idea and then go full out aggressive with whatever idea they're currently holding on to immediately. And so you have a situation where it, with people, for example, you might have some academics debating a small point and they don't disagree or they don't agree. They don't reach concord. So it moves out into say the student populace and sort of their influential circle of thinkers. And then from out there, it gets into the wider masses and then people go, I don't like this and I don't like that. And then there are those people out there who are ready to just go full out aggression and anger over any disagreement. And, and then because there are so many of those, and they've all sort of been intentionally or seemingly intentionally lined up in exact opposition and, and simultaneous in their appearance and their distribution. It's always one side or the other and very concrete factions. And so that exchange between those things is just uh, so startlingly intense that most people, especially if they don't have the ability to step outside and analyze the situation for a moment, it becomes so overwhelming that they then, without some sort of a mimetic intervention to kick them out, you know, something to kick you out of the wavelength for a second so you could see, they get so emotionally wrapped up in it, then it then becomes sort of a self-perpetuating cycle until the fire starts and then uh, shit gets pretty hectic. And I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, where along this sort of pattern of society where it's it's sort of coming from a base and then advancing and then becoming abundant and then becoming lax because of the abundance and then sort of um, becoming corrupted by that own uh, sort of uh, prideful abundance and yeah, the bureaucracy takes and, over and it ossifies into yeah, yeah. yeah and it eats itself where do you think we are sort of in that cycle of birth and death of culture uh well i'm looking at it less in terms of the the cyclical nature of that so and mm. you know social society level decay and renewal and i'm looking more at just the uh complexity chain so from point to line that's where we're at nobody's gone area volume <laughs> abstraction and gauge mm. Is okay. calibrated abstraction is where we need to fucking operate. So most of the problems that I see are, I would describe them as uh, in the same way Peterson does, is they're, they're low resolution problems. We're not looking at it at a high enough resolution to actually see all the data that's on the table. Hmm. So if, if I'm looking at stupid fucking people, a lot of times they're right, but they're right within the way they've construed and constrained their argument. So they've shunted all this stuff off. They've taken these 
select little pieces like magic bullet theory and put it into a, a little protected arena. And within that context and within the way they've constrained the questions, like, yeah, you're right in that context. But if you start stepping back and looking at where this fits within a much wider scale, you fucking lost the plot completely. Hmm. So, uh, the magic bullet theory or the fixation on like a, a single thing I can grab onto and it's going to take me through. I mean, I saw this, uh, a lot with the 90s self help movement and <clears throat> my ex's mother in law and my mom, like every fucking new book was, this was the one that was going to change everything. This was like the magic theory that was going to make it all, all right and fix society and do all this shit. And I see a lot of that, uh, now like kind of spinning off from the IDWs. Yeah. Yes, people are looking for new things, but like, okay, where's your, your fucking background in the institutional knowledge? Um, people are kind of talking about the, the ineffable and the numinous, and like, I have seen literally nowhere anyone have a reasonable discussion about Freemasonry. I mean, we have one extant mystery tradition around, but nobody's familiar with it. <laughs> and it uh, it's not really that hard. I and mean, in large part, people are kind of lazy. They don't want to work for the information. They want something spoon fed to them as opposed to here's a breadcrumb or here's a central follow that shit and figure it out. So in terms of, uh, what I'll call moral pedagogies, like we went, all the religious experience has its basis in paleolithic shamanism. And then you go along, you get to the point where you're culturally encoding things. <clears throat> and then there's a bifurcation point where you're looking at either rote tradition dogma, or you're looking at mystery traditions. Like here's a set of rules. Here's a set of tools. They're both basically moral pedagogical methods, but they have drastically different impact. This, the, here's a set of rules is like break you down. You're just going to fucking robot these out. And as soon as something is not contained in the textbook, well, you're kind of fucked. Uh, I don't have a rule for this. I don't know what to do. And then it's, you kind of break down as, as opposed to here's a set of tools. There's people who've gone before you kind of figured some of this shit out. Um, but you go figure out how to use them. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's another point where I'll take on Peterson when he's talking about Nietzsche and uh, Nietzsche's idea of like, we have to build this up from scratch. It's like, you're not reinventing the fucking wheel, but you are going into the substrata of culture. You're bringing these tools up and you're learning how to use them or discard them kind of from the, the ground up. And I think that type of thing needs to happen at the personal level. Not everybody's going to do it. Not everybody wants to do that kind of a deep dive. But if people are going to move in that direction, that's the type of infrastructure we need to have in place in order for them to do it effectively. So going back to the dualism, the dichotomy thing, it's like, uh, I think it was one of your podcasts. I went through and listened to a bunch of them last week just before we did this interview. Um, we're talking about slippery slope. <clears throat> So if you've got two poles, you place an axiom in the center that's like a, a moral panic issue, like abortion or guns or vaccines or whatever, all of a sudden it goes from being a flat field to you're falling one side of the axiom or the other, and it just gets steeper and steeper. So I think breaking that pattern is moving from point to point to, uh, let's see, see myself in the mirror or in the screen here. So you go from three points. Uh, I used to use the example like the old Star Trek. They'd have to, you know, jump through. They'd have to go a long distance. Warp drive is broken or whatever. So they head towards a, a star and do the slingshot thing around the star. Use the gravity momentum. Use the gravity uh, within the range of the star to go through pickup speed and get sling, slingshotted out. At a structural level, I think both Nietzsche and Zen um, basically did that same type of an operation. They're using nihilism as a vector, not a destination. So you're going from this to not this, and as soon as, as long as you're trapped in the not this, you're still completely fucking attached to it. You haven't broken that thing until you can take these two things and do the side step and do the synthesis and look at both perspectives and see what the fuck is going on. Ping pong's not going to do it. You need that third point out. <clears throat> so that's where you go from line to area. Once you've got that third point, 
So let's imagine that each of these points is basically a perspective, particular perspective on the world. You start adding these up and you can start tessellating or you know, triangle is the most efficient uh, geometry for doing this. Part of the reason why I uh, lean to it, but you can start to tessellate or break these things, spaces that I've experienced down. Now I'm not trapped on a fucking line that's ping ponging back and forth. Now I have a topology of landscape that I can understand things from different perspectives. Hmm. So you're kind of accumulating these different things and putting them into your, uh, your toolbox. And I mean, do it while you're young and the uh, neuroplasticity is rocking because once you're over like 35, 40, 50 years old, it starts to slow down a fucking lot. <laughs> hmm. uh, so people are losing the, the, the fluid intelligence as they age. But I think if you, if you've already kind of set the neurological patterns in there, you can come back to that. You're not doing it from scratch. Hmm. So I think in early life, you should be just kind of accumulating as many different experiences as possible so that you have um, kind of a broad topology and mapping of what's going on in the world where I think people have become more and more insular. It's like, okay, I have my Facebook, my Twitter feed and uh, fucking call of duty or whatever. And that's their world. They don't have touch points out of that. Uh, there's no, there's no physical interaction with the world. I mean, that's something that started to see fairly recently, it's like they have a really hard time training surgeons now because they lack the fine dexterity to do the surgery. These are people mm. who never fucking played outside. When I worked at the, the virtual uh, uh, virtual range, it was like a, a storefront business. We get everybody, like every spectrum of people under the sun coming in. <clears throat> and you get a nine-year-old kid who's played outside and is active. They can hold the gun, they can shoot. You get a 12 or 14 year old who's never played outside and they're like, eh, I can't pull the trigger. It's like it's a three, four pound trigger. It's not like it's hard. Hmm. Um, so the whole infantilization thing that we've been doing for decades, I think it's a really pernicious form of abuse. I mean, people are acting like, oh, I'm going to protect my child. I'm going to make sure they're okay. I mean, yeah, when they're I was thinking about this before, like the, the babies thing. There's part of the argument where it, like you, you don't let your children cry themselves to sleep. So I think early on, yeah, that makes sense. So when they're like up to a year and a half before they become toddlers, they should be close to the parents. They need to have security, feel safe, and do all that other stuff. But as they get up and start walking around and cruising, it's like, let them fall. Let them take some fucking bumps. Let them go outside without their mittens on. You can have a million fucking arguments every time you want to take your kid somewhere. Like, I don't want to wear my gloves. I don't want to wear my hat. It's like, okay, fine. We're going outside. Ten seconds later, well, you want your fucking mitts on now, don't you? It's pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not just talking out my ass. I'm not just trying to control you. Here, learn the fucking lesson directly. And have that direct experience. So it's a, it's a form of gnosis, direct knowledge. And uh, you're not going to have that fight anymore where, yeah, a lot of people just want want to kind of dictate. It's like, you need to do this. Well, why? Because you need to do it. Well, <laughs> that might work for people who are high in agreeableness and kind of compliant. But if you've got someone who questions things, shit doesn't fly. So you, you need to kind of understand why these decisions are. And it's like, well, here, go fucking try it without the safety equipment in place and see how you feel. And then usually people learn the lesson It's like, oh, okay. So you, you've learned the lesson that's like, there's a reason why I'm telling you to put on your mitts. And I'm not just talking out of my ass all the time. It's like when I'm asking you to do something, there's a reason behind that. So you can trust me to a degree or you can go figure the shit out yourself. Hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things, um, I, I was thinking about as you were talking and connecting with, um, and I want to try to connect them all. So maybe just bear with me as I, yep. as I kind of sort through this because there's a, you know, I'll tell you, it's interesting. There has been this trajectory in, in my life of, uh, 
sort of being exposed to a good, solid and obvious bit of wisdom. And then because of my sort of uh, contrarian nature, it's like, well, that seems like it's a great idea, but let's see what the opposite of that is. Uh, and I tried to, you know, I tried sort of all the main things like uh, order versus chaos in your life, rules versus just, you know, following your gut impulses or your, or your just like base desires and sort of going with the flow and then never going with the flow. And part of that is because, uh, you know, I am descended from Mormon pioneers on my father's side and I, I spent a lot of time in the Mormon church and I've read the Book of Mormon a couple times and I've read the Bible and a lot of the, uh, you know, most of the world's sort of religious tradition scriptures. And the thing that I kept coming to and, and it's sort of the, the church that Joseph Smith built is um, based on this principle is that there are, there are cycles and there are levels and there's sort of like this architecture to things in your life. And Joseph Smith was a Mason and he's reported to have said that he felt that the Masonic tradition was a direct line descendant of the priesthood of Solomon, but that it had lost the actual divine ordination of the priesthood that it had the rights and the tradition and the wisdom, but it didn't have the actual blessing of the Lord within it. And that's what he felt his job was in part with the church was to bring that tradition and then um, bring back in the sort of divine sanction combined to create a priesthood that then could go out into the world and manifest the blessings of a certain kind of life. And that, that life is built upon this dichotomy between exactly what you were talking about. There's the choice, there's the toolbox, or there's the rules and there's the sort of forced destiny. And that the interplay between these two things is the battle for existence. And it's the battle for heaven. And that this is sort of the whole point of things is where are you going to lie on this spectrum? Given that you came here with no sort of fundamental memory of this battle, that that's the point of this life is to come here and decide, are you going to be on the side of choice or the side of force? Are you going to be on the side of individual paradigmatic growth and through that growth, the connection to the broader community. And at every level, there's sort of more responsibility, but more potential to create more complex or powerful things. And that this pattern of ascension was set into motion by God, the eternal father, and that he is always creating a higher throne. And then the sort of geometry is that the thrones are filled by the people who are prepared to take that next seat. And I had just, I've been reading slowly this book by uh, Wei Han Zhang, Shang, Shang maybe, The Fractal Brain Theory. And one of the things that's very interesting in that book is that because he was looking to create a perfect AI simulation of a brain, and there's been quite a lot of research that he did and tied into this book, and the architecture is always, is always bifurcated but that there are these chains of bifurcations that give rise to the shape of the, of the landscape, but that there are these, there are these points where there is emergent features that come at a certain point in complexity. And then they operate within those bounds until there's sort of a next order of magnitude. And I've been thinking about this concept the whole time we've been talking because that's because you're thinking of it um, more from a, sort of a specifically geometrical um, perspective than I am. But it's been helpful to me to be thinking about things in the shape of things that way, because I think of things a lot in terms of the flow of things. Yeah. Um, and there was one just little last point that I wanted to tie into this, which was that 
I was playing around with the GPT-2 sort of a writing finishing uh, interface yesterday. And I was writing about paradigms and paradigmatic ascension. And it was funny because I would write like a piece of a sentence and then it would continue to fill in the blanks. And it was interesting because it said I, I had like the rules of paradigmatic ascension and had it just go on or that, uh, and it was, I'm paraphrasing, but it was basically like that there is a system and that there are a system of systems and that then there are, is a hierarchy of these systems. And then there's a hierarchy of the exchange between the system and the system of systems and the hierarchy itself. And that this is, um, and that when you realize one of these levels of the architecture, it becomes a totally different interface with different operational boundaries and stuff. And I, I would only fill in a couple of words and this is basically what it was saying about this process. And it kind of blew my mind because the bounds of this AI with rules could take what I was thinking about and even very abstract idea like that and sort of gave boundaries and a flow to the idea with almost no input from me, but it was right in keeping with kind of what I was thinking about. Uh, and I guess I wonder how fundamental this, I, I wonder if you think that this chain is just fundamental to everything that there's a, I wonder how much the balance between the personal choice and the infinite sort of exchange how much can you influence that or, or is that even what is even the question to ask between those two things i'll diverge for a minute so it, i don't have you watched westworld i have not okay um it's a show about a it starts off it's a show about a theme park that's full of uh ai robots that easily pass the train test hmm. so I think these AI that are in the show, it, it, the show is basically about some of these AIs becoming sentient. Um, but I think the AIs in the show are probably the best psychological model we have for kind of your mainstream Joe. So as meatbag robots, most of what we do is completely fucking habituated. Understand we're all AI programmers effectively when we're dealing with our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the default mode network and the left brain is effectively an AI. Um, actually thinking, engaging in deep problem solving stuff is a very expensive process and you can't fucking do it 24 seven. I mean, that's part of time cycling some of that stuff off so that it can do that type of processing but it needs to reintegrate back into the system. So I think we have a lot of people walking around who are all effectively artificial intelligence <clears throat> in terms of that default mode network, but some people haven't bothered to do any performance tuning. They've just taken it off the shelf and they're going to fucking run with it until they get the grade. Where I think it's your, in large degree, it's a, it's a responsibility to program that system effectively. So we're kind of circling back to intentional and disciplined habituation. If you want to fix or upgrade your default mode network, then you need to engage in these um, disciplined acts of habituation. So your habituation aren't just fucking random. They're not peer pressure. They're not uh, emotional pressure or influence from external sources. So you're not going to think about things every day as you're going through stuff, but when things come up, it's like, okay, here's a, a threshold or a crossroad point. I need to stop, analyze what the fuck is going on here, set a rule that gets integrated into the default mode network. And when I come back to that space again, let's validate and check the rule sets. Let's do some error correction on the rule sets. So just getting into that pattern of, okay, the rule set, okay, it's it's not congruent completely with what's going on in the environment now. Let's do a little of assessment and tweak it. Um, part of one of the things that struck me when you're doing that description is I use the idea of uh, quantum boundaries. 
So looking at a computer, you can't tell what's happening in the electrons. Looking at the electrons in the computer isn't going to what's isn't going to tell you what's happening at the program application level. Hmm. So there's kind of a quantum boundary in between. And I think in terms of people and comprehension, a lot of them are stuck below quantum boundaries. They haven't gone far enough up the hill. They can see the next mountaintop. They know there's a mountain there and they think they've understood it all, but you don't understand what's in the valley between here and that next fucking mountain. Hmm. So I think uh, the Mount Stupid diagram they use to explain the Dunning-Kruger effect kind of does that fairly well. It's like, oh, I learned something. I'm a fucking expert now. I can see the next mountain peak. It's like, you have no fucking idea how much topology is between here and here. Yeah. And that's a successive, as I'm fond of saying, the learning <laughs> curve is infinite. Perfection isn't found this side of the grave. The learning curve is infinite. What you can do is reduce your engage error correction, reduce your margin of error. And if even if you're doing that, you're reducing your margin of error by two or three percent. What does that look like over two, three thousand iterations? It's a fucking huge difference. So it's like a compounding interest thing. So no, you're never going to be perfect. Nobody is. Get over it. It doesn't mean you can't still get your shit together and be much fucking better than you were before. You know, uh, most of the people who listen to this podcast are at least familiar with the notion that I wrote a book called Uncommon Mentality. And I've often described it as sort of a manual for how to brainwash yourself yeah. <laughs> and to choose the rules by which you do that. And, and one of the one of the themes that you were hitting on there is something that I talk a lot about in that book and give a lot of exercises around. And it's it's the it's the sort of a standard operating system and what kind of conditions will cause you to alter it and how can you create conditions similar enough to those automatic choice making times or like a inputs which will allow you to effectively iterate a, a situation inside of your mind that will be almost the same impact as though you were actually experiencing that moment in that way in in your real life and through that process of creating specific vantage points or inserting a new bit of wisdom or an idea into a situation to flavor it in a way that allows you to process it more effectively that you can then consciously uh, iterate enough times and with enough intensity that you can change the rule uh, because you've you've both constructed a situation in which it's close enough to the natural um, sort of inflection point that you trick enough of the processes within your psychology uh, into thinking it's real, that it, it might as well be real. And that then you can take a look at the issues that you're having, the decisions that you continue to make that are not working to your benefit. And you can, both do the work to try to understand why that is, but then also do the work through things like visualization and creating triggers and, and different things to be able to uh, go in and flip that switch enough times with intention that then it starts to habituate and then you can sort of move that out into the real world and operate that way. Uh, and this kind of thinking, and I, and I use this process on myself to change a lot of behaviors. And that's why I wrote the book, because I know everybody has some things they'd like to improve upon. And this kind of thinking has sort of led me to be thinking a lot about the broader education system and how uh, with all the access that we have to understanding, like we've been talking about today, uh, and te technological capabilities and um, understanding how people work a little bit better and, and there's a there's a real opportunity in the in the sphere of education to be able to create something that is more suited to creating more opportunity 
and direction in more people than we currently are capable of doing and in a way that would leave them feeling satisfied and gratified at the experience at a much higher level than our current education system, which is pretty dismal at this point in terms of uh, both preparing somebody for the actual day-to-day -day discipline of living and then for understanding how to arm themselves and to defend themselves in the sort of uh, cultural milieu which contains so many uh, weapons or, or sort of pitfalls that a person can fall into that can then lock them into this cycle we've been talking about where there's no high level exchange because it's been kicked over into the just straight up emotional um, realm. And I guess where, where do you suppose if a person was conscious of this, say, um, issue and they wanted to influence it, what is the, what is the personal inflection point that allows a person to uh, be able to make as much of an impact as they can with their capabilities versus maybe some of the things you see that people might be applying their intention or energy to that don't uh, necessarily have an impact in the direction that they'd like. So sort of what do you suppose is the, is the best way to make an impact and what do you suppose are some of the ways you could just be spinning your wheels that are most common? I, I don't know if I can answer that directly, but I'll, I'll walk around it a bit. So I think unless if you've reached the end of puberty and you haven't developed any type of introspection, it's probably not going to happen. Hmm. And if you reach 25 without engaging some kind of introspection, metacognition, chances are it's never going to happen in your life until or unless trauma forces you into that position. So as a default, most people are, are not engaged in that. In order to do that um, assessment of habits and assessment of input, you need to have metacognition. You need to understand your own thinking to some degree. So I, the first part of it is that uh, <clears throat> being able to detach from the emotional layer and um, people's lack of ability to read that i think is really evident because most people can't tell the difference between egoic attachment in an argument in terms of an intensity they read intensity or lack of intensity so most people can't tell the difference between an egoic attachment to an argument versus an impassioned argument so the 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 superficial read in terms of body language and everything else might be identical unless you start looking at the structure of the language of what's being said and how it's being said that's where the differentiation is going to be is someone um, you know I'm right you're wrong then and then and kind of bullshit or you're like look you're not seeing the whole fucking pattern here I'm walking around you trying to breadcrumb and you not realizing there's actually just a bigger fucking context to this problem that we're talking about here. Um, mm. So figuring out those perceptions in terms of remediation. So I, I don't think we we talked about this before, but like 20 years ago, I had uh, like a Vox Verba experience. So Vox is uh, hearing the word of, and Verba is uh, hearing as it's spoken. By or spoken by angelic or some kind of uh, distance thing. So that was on a really fucking heavy mushroom trip, I think almost yeah. half an ounce. Allegedly. Uh, allegedly, yeah. I, yeah, I used to do what they, I guess most people are calling heroic doses <laughs> on a fairly regular basis when I was digging into shamanism before I got into more uh, formalized mystery traditions. So I had this experience and I was I was tripped out, I was meditating, and then out of nowhere, it was just like this explosive. If you go to the, uh, the Sephir Ben uh, thing on Medium or on GitHub, that's basically the glyph that I saw. It was an equilateral triangle, but it was an Archimedean spiral in each of the segment, segments of the triangle. And it flashed and it went <laughs> and filled it, like the lightning just filled it out. And the words that accompanied it were, he appeared to me in flash and thunder, I am but a stone before him. 
So that experience is what pushed me towards uh, Freemasonry in the first place, because I wanted to understand in terms of that whole progression from paleolithic consciousness to now, you need to kind of go back to the root, follow that chain up and understand um, the whole chain of what's going on in order to actually understand what we are doing here. I think there's an analog in terms of technical and scientific knowledge. If you go back to the 1920s and 30s, all of those books are talking about base principles. So you really understand base principles starting in like the 70s and 80s. It's like, well, here's a photoresistor and you, you, you're not understanding the principles of how we got from low level electronic stuff to photoresistor. Hmm. Not really understanding the base principles. It's like, oh, here's a widget or a commodity I can take off and I can put the widgets together like Lego, but I have no fucking idea how to actually make it from the ground up. There's there's a thing about uh, people that it's so sort of a it's a constant source of fascination and and frustration and entertainment both, which is um, the interplay between these things. You know, you talked about you talked about how if a person hasn't developed the power to be introspective by puberty, uh, it's not likely to happen. And by 25, once that uh, cortex finishes developing, and it's sort of uh, like this is this is your this is your operating space now. Um, it's going to take something traumatic or intense to kick them into that space. Um, and this is if you if you look at it uh, through this lens. There are two pieces of wisdom that come to mind. And the first is sort of that this is the, this is the process, the ability to develop the introspection necessary to uh, have that metacognition of this is what I did and this is what I'm doing and thinking about doing and things. That's what it means to become a human. You look at the story of Adam and Eve, for example, and once they yeah. develop metacognition, that's when they become a human. And that's when they move out of the Garden of Eden or this blissful existence and then turn and start working and procreating in the land to create a specific kind of condition under which... Unless you have that optimally. error correction, sorry, unless you have that error correction process in place, which is effectively metacognition, you can't individuate. You're dealing with the deck that you're dealt and you can't actually individuate. So I think that's part of the issue is like people, the, whatever's going on with this crazy movement right now, is like people are de-individuating. They're becoming the group. They're just, they're fucking cogs, completely fucking cogs. You could, <laughs> some of the arguments I hear, I've heard people making the same arguments word for word for 30 fucking years. It's like, has it helped? Has it changed anything? Has it made us a more civil and fair society? No, these are empty fucking platitudes and you haven't actually dug into the problem enough to honor what the problem is. It's like you're trying to give a band-aid to an amputee. That, that shit doesn't work and it's an insult to the victim. Hmm. So we really need to dig a whole lot deeper with that. I mean, so the Vox Verba experience I was talking about, that was like 20 years ago. I basically shelved that until Almost a year and a half ago, it was after the IDW stuff had come up, and I had uh, I came across a, a TED talk from uh, James Flynn, who calls himself a moral uh, philosopher, but he did a fairly deep dive into uh, psychology, uh, and his work was heavily influenced by this Russian psychologist named uh, Alexander Luria. So Luria went around all over Russia doing these kind of surveys and he basically mapped out um, what are the core psychotechnologies between the pre-modern brain and the modern brain and it was effectively the ability to engage in abstraction to uh, effectively classify and the other one was uh, the correct application of the hypothetical 
the, those three structural things. Like you go through a couple of scenarios. Like, okay, Ger uh, Germany is a, a country that has no camels. Berlin is the capital of Germany. How many camels are in Berlin? <laughs> and lots of people, uh, they're trying to figure it out. How big is the population? How many camels? Were there? Like, no, there's no fucking camels there. Uh, another thing was like people seeing bears. They've never been far enough north to see a polar bear. And it's like the answer's kind of in the question. And then they're like, oh, well, all bears are brown. It's like the, the ability to, it's a resolution issue, plus the ability to extrapolate and do these other things. So when I saw those three pillars, basically, for me, those were the points of the triangle. Those are the three most core and fundamental skills that we need to develop effectively in order to reach all of the other stuff that we're trying to get at. So being able to classify things effectively, again, it's, it's when we're talking about these poles, humans are basically vacillating wildly between these two things. They can't find the middle point. And if it's in, stuck in dichotomy, it's always going to be the ping pong shit. When you go into two dimensions and create the triangle, then you have your your most stable geometry at the most minimal effort. You have a structure that you can start to build on from there. If you want to go in three dimensions, well, we've got a tetrahedron. That's also the simplest structure there. I think that geometry aligns to a degree with what they're talking about with uh, Planck space and physical Planck pixels, basically. Um, yeah, the Flynn-Lyria thing is worth looking up. I think those three skills are really the most fundamental pieces of where we need to start in terms of educating people and giving them tools. Um, and not spoon feeding everything. Like it's not yours if you didn't really work for it. Hmm. So kind of circling back to that Nietzschean thing. Uh, it's like you're going to the foundations of the temple and you're rebuilding. I mean, that's a metaphoric exercise I think everyone needs to do to de-individuate. It's like you can go pick these up, these tools up, like buy them from Walmart, I can use them, break or not break or whatever, but until you've engaged with that tool enough to at least, maybe you're not to a degree of mastery, but at least have some fucking competence so you're not worse than useless. <laughs> Uh, if you're just useless, you're not going to create any other issues. If you're worse than useless, you're trying to fix something and you're actually creating more fucking problems than somebody else is going to have to clean up later. Uh, and that's was a, literally a big chunk of my career was fixing stupid fucking mistakes other people made earlier on and trying to find a solution to uh, make these things scale within business. Mm. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of wandering a bit from there because that goes off in a whole bunch of different directions. But those three skills, I mean, the Hagura ritual that I put up on uh, on Medium is kind of based on that, where I think we need something like Freemasonry distributed more amongst the population. So we need some aspect of mystery tradition. We're basically lost in terms of coming of age rituals. And those types of things that mark the boundary points between childhood and adulthood. And it's like, well, you're past the boundary point now. You can't use the children's mechanisms anymore. Like, fuck off, you're an adult. You can't play that shit anymore. It's no longer acceptable. You're not suckling with mom. You need to nut up and start dealing like an adult. So I think the lack of coming of age rituals in that, in society in general, is been a, a, a major factor because now teenagehood goes up to fucking 30. <laughs> That's not really helpful for people. I mean, there's failure to launch, there's uh, arrested development, psychosocially, intellectually, everything. Um, yeah, it's tough. And we have a massive degree of complexity that we need to face and we're just, we're poorly equipped as a species in the first place. And we've been doing a fucking spectacular job of hampering ourselves from even getting close to the ability to doing those types of things. There's a, 
There's this scene in the first Dune book by Frank Herbert. And it's the Benny Gesserit human test with the Gom Jabbar. And you have a box that you put your hand in and it makes it feel like your flesh is starting to hurt and then burning and then melting off. It's just sort of like a pain creator with the varying degrees of intensity. And as your hand is in there, you have a needle placed against your neck that is poisonous and just one prick and you will die. You will certainly die. And the test is, will you leave your hand in the box and not jerk it out to save your life? Will you sacrifice the hand to save your life or will you let your base instincts make you jerk your hand out and you will die? And in this scene, the protagonist is exposed to the highest possible degree of pain and passes the test. And there's a confrontation between the boy's mother and her mother superior in the Bene Gesserit order. And she's saying, why did you do that so much? You exposed him to a higher level than I've ever seen before. And the woman was saying, well, we had to really be sure that this was a human because of what you've done. You've created this person that the, the pattern is not set for all the way yet. And the reason that I bring this up is because part of what happens in this story arc is that this person who passes this test is exposed to the game of power at the highest levels and comes close to losing everything, but then is thrust into this environment, which is the harshest environment that people live in, in the universe, essentially. And when he's thrust into that environment, he learns how to survive and the pattern had already been set in certain ways. And, and what it teaches you is that there are people who can pass that human test at the highest levels of pain or struggle or responsibility. And there are people who can't pass that test at all, but there's a spectrum of those people. But if you don't pass the human test, then you will be led by the people who have passed the human test and that the people who have the capacity to take on the complexity and responsibility and still remain a human have the most responsibility and have the greatest capacity to design the rules and the architecture of the culture in such a way that they will have the highest probability of surviving in any condition because the great enemy is annihilation. That's the whole, the trajectory of that entire series is eventually that the goal, once they saw the way reality operated, was to advance the human population to such a great distance and degree and so many iterations that it would then be impossible for it to ever go extinct again because there would not be the possibility of um, some one single force being able to wipe all of them out and so humanity would live on in perpetuity. That's sort of the entire story arc of the, of the series. And this is why I'm, this is why I'm wondering and want to ask you, um, we've been talking at a very sort of a, a higher level than a lot of people have considered a lot of these ideas. And I wonder what, what is the place just in a person's life, average Joe's life right now, where they can, uh, wherever they're at in this process discovery, what's like the one place they can apply their efforts that will help them to advance their understanding of the way things work and, and their place within it. Understand that the learning curve is infinite and engage it. Be hungry for knowledge. So I mean, in terms of my industry, uh, in software development, if I saw someone who stated in like, so this is in terms of uh, interviewing process and things like that, because I was also quite involved with that for many different companies. Uh, so if I'm doing an interview and I see that someone in my industry has been at the same job for like five to seven years, 
unless they're spectacular in the interview, I'm probably not going to hire them because there's a degree of complacency. If you're in software development and you're in the same job for five to seven years, you're not engaging that learning curve. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, a heavy personal bias there because I don't think I've ever worked for a company more than like 18 to 24 months. <laughs> I either get sick and tired of the bullshit and politics or uh, people don't want me around because I'm sick and tired of the bullshit and politics. It's like I, if I'm signing a, uh, a contract, uh, rub and tub with the manager's ego is not a fucking clause I will sign off on ever. I'm here to do my job in the most professional capacity I can do so. And I will do that aggressively, even if it means stepping on some fucking toes. Because if someone makes a shitty decision and my team has to, you know, the next three fucking weeks has to stay until eight o'clock, can't see their family for dinner or whatever. Like, that's not acceptable. I seems way too much fucking negligence for people. So the, just the intention of wanting to embrace, embrace the learning curve and wanting to learn. That's the, the most fundamental thing I think you can engage. If you do that, it, I, you know, the harder the better to a degree, but as long as you're doing it, you're capable of making some kind of improvement. If you're not willing to invest that type of energy into yourself in, in order to uh, just have a more robust understanding of what's around in the world, then what the fuck are you bring to the table to do for anybody else? You're stuck in a little rut and uh, you're trying to teach other people here, come be stuck in the rut with me. But like you kind of need, you need to embrace the learning curve and it's infinite. I mean, we can push that awesome code as hard as we can. We're never going to reach perfection in any degree or capacity, but you need to engage that. And that notion needs to be some aspect of our social strata because I don't think it matters how fucking smart you are. If you grow up in a, an environment where basically the earth has been salted and nothing fucking grows in terms of a intellectual or cognitive level, there's only so much progress you're going to make in one lifetime. You're one person, you're one set of resources. There's only so far you can go. So, I mean, that's kind of where our visionaries of the past were. They were one person. They went way the fuck ahead of where everybody else was, but they somehow were able to make uh, things human readable, which is not really a skill that I have, uh, but make it human readable and to integrate that into culture. So individual cognition is always bootstrapping off of whatever the psycho technologies and culture are. The better this tool set is within culture, um, the, the further this art can go because you're not having to go and figure shit out from scratch. I mean, I, grew up with a bunch of dumb fucking rednecks. All the shit I learned was self-taught. So not everybody's got that drive for self-learning, but you need to have some aspect of it. You don't have to be a kind of a fucking nutcase like I am and deep dive into absolutely everything. But <clears throat> there has to be some push, some kind of hunger there to do that. You know... <laughs> This is, um, these are the reasons that I um, sort of apply leverage in the places that I do or, sh or share of my essence in the places and in the ways that I do with this podcast, with the book that I wrote, that the things I try to highlight, um, it's, uh, it's sort of like my accepted purpose is to the fundamental truth of education is that it's not just a collection of facts it's it's how it's what shapes what you do the the rules that you accept then shape your actions and your actions then shape the world uh, and your life is sort of like a, this you have this consciousness moving through and just meeting a, a particular moment in time that's got a particular set of functions and a landscape and things and you just go through and you move stuff around and you, you just rearrange the architecture and uh, if it if it falls apart you know that you're sort of 
That was, that was an annihilating pattern. And if it stays relatively the same, you're just sort of, but then if it grows or advances, then you, you understand that you have um, sort of optimized that process beyond just the status quo. And then you continue to build on those things and you look for the places in which stuff's falling apart and you try to stop that from happening. And all of this is, uh, that's why I have found value in mystery traditions, in scripture, in some of these things like the, the Bible is a great example because it presents to you a lot of different conundrums and forces you to contend with them. And through that process of contention, you, you develop this ability to look at different sides of things and to make the inflection point, there's your choice. It's sort of like, here's something presented to you. It's this or that, contend with this. And you go, well, I think it's actually this. This is what I think this is. And that builds your sort of mental framework. And if you accept within you ideas that don't let you build that framework because you remove the component of choice or deciding for yourself how you feel about the situation, then you don't have the platform or the foundation or the architecture to actually, like you said, individuate into a person who has decided what rules they're operating by. And this is why I, one of the main things I try to get people to do, and I always try to take things like this and then simplify it in a way that people could just go do it right now. And what I ask people to do is to go write down 10 rules that are their rules. This is what I think is the way to operate in life. And just to remind yourself of those rules and to try to operate by those rules and, and see what happens in your life. Decide who you are through your rules and then see if you really live that way. And then if you don't, ask yourself why and try to inflect in those places that you can align yourself to your highest ideal. And that is the learning process. And that's why I'm interested in this. And that's, um, that's why I've been quite enjoying this conversation because this process that we sort of take for granted as kids, you put the kids in the school system, say, and then they get out and they go live a life that has relatively little to do with that education. It's like a demarcation point of childhood, but there's no, uh, like you said, sort of rite of passage. There's no concrete. It's just like um, you were in this system that didn't really prepare you to live and gave you some knowledge that wasn't, uh, most of this wasn't that useful to you or even maybe accurate. And then now go live your life. Whereas the, the system that optimizes a person for life, there is no sort of, um, the principles that you learn are the whole, it's like the, the point and the process all tied into one. You choose how to live and then you watch what happens and you should choose the side of not annihilation at the very least. And that there are levels to that, that there are, you know, you, there are levels to the way you can understand something. And the higher the level you get, the more sort of power that is within you to bring to bear because of that understanding and knowing how to use it. If you design the system to teach that and then apply it specifically to different areas of knowledge and action, and then allow a person to develop the things that they like, and then to support those things with the things that will help them not crumble apart the base of their architecture, that that is the system that gives people the greatest opportunity to do amazing things and to live a life they actually want to live. And that we're doing miserable at that as a collective society. Um, and part of it is because what you've talked about with this sort of low level oscillation of, of just sort of stunted discourse and I, I guess I, I just wonder, man, uh, what, what do you suppose is going to happen because of this seeming inability to pull the cultural momentum and dialogue out of this uh, just sort of very base, simplistic space that it's operating in at such a high intensity? I don't know. I think we could be facing collapse, quite honestly, in terms of the social level. Um, 
if things get to the point where they interrupt our whole just-in-time networks and all this global interdependency in terms of commerce, if that if the social destabilization hits there, then it's just fucking <laughs> down the tubes real fucking quick. I mean, with uh, I don't know, Europe or Asia's like, but just-in-time markets here, basically your supermarket has three days worth of food. And when that's done, if there's no new stuff coming in, like it's cut off. It's not a gradual transition. It's like the wall, the tap just fucking turned off completely. Um, and I, yeah, there's the, the, the attachment to things and commodity, whether those commodities are physical objects or whether they're experiences or whatever else, the, the fixation thing is kind of a problem. While you were speaking before, I was kind of thinking back to something I learned fairly early with psychedelics. Like, people will want to go and do a heroic dose or whatever, and they're like, oh, I'm going to write all this stuff down. And like, no, no it, it doesn't work that way. You're, it's like high speed zen. You're in a flow state. You think of something stupid, and boom, it's instantaneous. <laughs> um, it's kind of thrown right back in your face. So, you, distance yourself, whether it's psilocybin or ecstasy or something like that, you kind of distance yourself from the emotional stuff and you're going through these hyper quick loops. So you're not there to record the journey and tell that all the angels or whatever the fuck you interacted with. You're there to do high speed processing and tune the system. So the point of coming out the other end is that you've gone in, done this super intense um, error correction exercise and you come out process change, not item change. And I think in terms of the growth thing, it's not continually growing out, getting bigger, whatever. Our our major growth is actually increasing the resolution of things. So if I've got this square and I've got nine pixels in this square, that's kind of the, at the level where most people are thinking at or in cognitive chunking, people are looking at like four to six buckets that they can kind of fit things in. So you go from this transition from buckets, I got a bucket of facts and items and whatever, like the low learning, <laughs> to the transition of, I'm starting to think in schema. So those, when you start getting into systems, systems are systems are systems. There's a lot of really common metaphors that play out structurally across all different types of systems. Yes, they're going to be uh, domain-specific intricacies or inter uh, constraints, but you need to separate the pattern from the context. And I think that's something else that people are really shitting at doing, shitty at doing. So, whenever people talk about kind of uh, kind of brain dead thinking or whatever, it goes, "Oh, those religious people." And it's like, no, it's it's the problem of orthodoxy. It doesn't matter what domain. It's infecting whether it's uh, dogmatic religion or whether it's uh, science. If people start going from homodoxy or groupthink into orthodoxy, where you can't challenge the groupthink into dogma and ideology, that's uh, kind of a, a pre predictable slide and decay. So we basically need this <clears throat> balance of heterodoxy where we're able to get new information coming in, balanced with some aspect of homodoxy or at least shared experience because you can't have any aspect of community until you build some kind of shared experience. That's what your bonding point for the community is. And in terms of cultural development, those are our tradition and novelty. We're always trying to play those two forces. It's like, I think that's where dogma and ideology fail. And I'll use Ideology in Peterson's definition is a parasitic mythology, not as a developed worldview. That's one of the few cases where, in, in most instances, I will go back to the etymological history. Like, we've lost something in this word here. We need to kind of recover where the word comes from. Ideology is one of the few words where I'll, I'll say the, the modern uh, interpreta interpretation of it, uh, or spe specifically Peterson's use of it, as a parasitic mythology, is the appropriate context. So when people say, every ideology has a place at the table, I'm like, fuck no. No ideology has a place at the table, ever. Bring as many methodologies as you like. We will sort it out. But the ideology, go sit on the fucking stairs until you can become an adult. 
ideology already has the answers before the question has been posed. That is not a way to solve problems. And at, at, at a, I guess at a deep personal emotive level, it's solving the fucking problems that matters to me. I mean, one of the recurrent nightmares I had as a kid was just very fucking weird and abstract. I was basically just passing across this featureless plane until turbulence would come up. And then it would start to just like grind through these mountains of turbulence and then finally push through, get to the other side, of, and then just the same thing, go across this flat plane at ever increasing speed until smashing into the shit again. And like, that so feels like what we're doing as a society. <laughs> we get through the shit and then we just go back to the same old stuff, play it out until the next time and the next time. And it's like, well, we're, we're running out of next time. The world is a finite space. Growth markets are a Ponzi scheme by definition. So we can't just accumulate more shit. We need to have more refinement in what we're actually seeing. That's the way to create more topology, more space. I think. Hmm. Well, look, man. We're getting to about that time. And I think we've covered uh, a lot of ground. There's a lot for people to consider and think about contained in this conversation. And so I think what I want to know is maybe you could offer up some final thoughts on this one. It's just that we sort of laid it out there. And people can do with that what they're going to do with that, I guess. Um, but if there's a if there's a if there's sort of one thing, a closer. Okay, yeah, I'll go with it. What's your what's your takeaway, man? There is no such thing as good faith emotional persuasion. It's an exploit against the limbic system. It's not an argument. Hmm. So if you look to Aristotle, he's got three modes of persuasion. Pathos, emotional, ethos, the ethical, logos, the logical, or the rational. Um, ethos and logos have some capacity to them. Pathos might be an etymological reason why it's the root of pathology. So that's something well worth considering. If people are making an emotional argument, it's because they're trying to bypass the prefrontal cortex and hack the meat bag by going to a lower order system where it's easier to, easier to run the exploit. So the first thing I think to look at is the emotional triggers. Cut off the emotional, or like, you know, freeze that emotional aspect of the response. Step back two or three layers to look at what's actually happening in the environment without the emotional play. And I think the, the pathos exploit is what people have been running for the last 30 years. And it goes more and more towards that, like the whole harm care dynamics, all the stuff with uh, disgust and sensitivities, uh, high towards and it was Jonathan and I's work as well, worth looking at in that context as well. But yeah, you, you use your brain. <laughs> it's a pretty fucking complicated computer up there. Um, spent a couple of million years in evolutionary development and uh, kind of supercharged like the last 20 or 40,000 years in terms of what we're capable of. Um, as long as we've been anatomically modern homo sapiens sapiens, we've had that same brain power there. So yeah, I mean, leverage it. Understand that you are an artificial intelligence until such point as you become an in, in <clears throat> That's the word I'm looking for. You want to be doing this by choice as an integrated intelligence, as an intentional being, not just something you picked up off the shelf and you're carrying along with. So that takes work. People want to customize the shit out of their cars and trucks, but they, they, they don't want to customize this. <laughs> and that's where we need to be putting the effort. Sort of like a, experiencing 
what am I experiencing? Why am I experiencing it? What am I going to do about it? <laughs> you got to, yeah. you got to get all the way to what am I going to do about it in order to be actually a, be an instantiated person rather than just sort of like a, an, an environmental. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So uh, I guess the message is be a human being. <laughs> be your individual, individuated self. Embrace that learning curve and find out what you can be. Maybe you won't reach the absolute pinnacle of your potential, but you'll get further than you are now. Hmm. As long as you're putting the effort and work into it. I mean, as I said before, two, three percent difference over thousands of iterations. It's a fucking huge change of the outcome. Well, I can put my endorsement behind that. So I guess I, I just want to thank you for coming on. I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't necessarily sure, uh, what you were getting into. What, yeah. What our conversation was going to be like, and yeah. it took a very interesting and contemplative and, and thoughtful turn. So I uh, appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom and your thoughts with, uh, with me and with the audience as well. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I was looking forward to us actually having a face-to-face -face sometime. Uh, Twitter's a little uh, constrained. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not quite come enough. Crusty, angry fucker over there. <clears throat> well, but I, I, guess I mean, that's in part person of that too. Persona so. role I'm playing there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, dude. If you're good, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. I'd like to chat again sometime, but I, I think that's a, a reasonable uh, block for people to digest. Yeah, me too. <laughs> There's plenty to digest, or digest there. Yep. So in that case, you're good. I'm good. This has been the Logo Centrifugal Podcast. I've been Chance Lunsford. He's been Longstone. And this has all been Allegedly. And we're out.